Welcome to episode 20 of How About Them Huskies. I'm Connor. I'm joined with Matt, Andrew, and Matt. And we finally made it to episode 20. I don't. I honestly didn't think we'd make it this far with the podcast. And I'll just say episode 20, a little bit different vibes than episode 10. Episode 10, we were coming off a win against Butler, 12-0. and 0. One of the segments in there is, when will we lose a game? Well, now episode 20, we're 15-5. and 5, Just came off a tough loss on the road at Seton Hall, 67-66. to 66. And there's really... There's really not too much to say that hasn't already been said. I mean, I guess I'll let one of you guys jump in here. It's just a tough loss. It's been a bunch of tough losses recently. But you guys, any of you guys want to jump in here? Yeah, I just want to say something. Look, I'm going to be honest. I know the result wasn't great the other night, but I'm proud of these guys. The turnaround they had after finding out the day of that their coach and assistant coach who do a lot of the legwork for this team are going to be out. Seen Hall isn't a bad team. Um, so... I'm proud of these guys, but, you know, obviously you want to see a win. And that was a gut-wrenching loss. It was absolutely gut-wrenching, and that can't be good for morale. But the thing is, I just want to see them respond from this. Um, Sometimes you really need some stuff like this to happen. You really need this to build character. That's one thing about this team being undefeated at one point was there wasn't that much character building. Now there's a lot of character building going on. And I just want to say that even though the result wasn't there, they played – Great for a lot of the game. The wheels fell off at the end of the game. But for the cards they were dealt, I'm proud of them. And I think they just need to keep consistent and things will turn around soon here. Yeah, well, I'm I think that this they should forget about the fact that they're 15 and five and just focus on Butler and then forward for the rest because there's still a lot of important games. I mean Every game's important at this point, but I mean, do you have chances to beat people that you already lost to? I mean, St. John's at the Garden, Xavier and Providence at the Gamble, um, and then Seton Hall at Gamble. So you've you've got chances to beat everybody that you've lost to already, and that's what's going to be really important in these next stretches. Is that don't don't get too bummed out because of these. I mean, like Connor posted on Instagram, you know, the fifteen and five with two different feelings. I mean. That is true, but at the same time, we have to remember how this season's gone for us. I mean, we were unranked in the preseason poll, and in my opinion, the preseason stuff really doesn't matter at all. I mean, you could rank uh, Matt squad over at Merrimack College at one, and it really wouldn't matter because it's the preseason. Nobody knows who's going to get hurt, who's going to play good and bad. So the preseason stuff, I think they should just throw that out the window, in my opinion. But we just we have to remember that the fact that we're 15-5 and five, at this time, when it was supposed to be, supposedly this was supposed to be a rebuild year for us, you know, get some transfers, develop some people, and then reload for next year. But, I mean, we had the same record with both teams. So I think we just have to let these losses go. Don't get too mad about them. And, you know, we're still going to be a pretty high seed in March. So the real season doesn't start till March. I'll say that much. You know, whether you win or lose these games, I don't really believe that this is what makes you a good or bad team. 20 games into the season, I don't believe that having five losses makes you either a good or a bad team. It's how you respond to those losses. And this this loss here um, was definitely the worst one, in my honest opinion, out of the five. You're leading the game for 39 minutes and 45 seconds, and you somehow managed to lose. I mean, that has to feel like a terrible, you know, this has to be one of the worst feelings a lot of these guys have felt, especially starting the way they did, having the momentum they did. And, you know, being ranked number two, that's like a big responsibility. That's a big, it's a big deal being the number two uh, team in the country. So, you know, being the number two team in the country doesn't define them. Losing four to five, five out of six doesn't define them. It's how they respond to this adversity that really shows the team that they are. And, you know, moving forward, uh, if we can manage to bounce back and we, we beat all these guys at home, we beat St. John's at home or no, we beat St. Uh, beat St. John's on the road, beat Seton Hall at home, beat all these guys, beat Xavier at home. I feel like that is what truly will make us a good team responding, coming back and showing everybody, hey, you know, we were good. This was a fluke and this is not to be expected. Yeah, despite all the struggles over the past three weeks, you look at our resume, we are still probably a fringe three, maybe a high four seed in that area, which that's higher than last year. So even though we've struggled these past three weeks or so, losing five or six, I mean, the team's still not in that bad of a spot. Obviously in the Big East standings, I believe they're sixth place, but 
there's still a long season. There's 11 conference games left, if I'm not mistaken. So a lot of time to make up that ground. And also maybe, maybe this is a stretch here. But maybe this team isn't built for the Big East in a sense that we went undefeated in non-conference play. Obviously, a bunch of cupcakes in there. But we beat some pretty respectable teams. Out of the five teams we beat that are power conferences in the non-conference, I'd say all of them at least have a slight chance to make the tournament. Obviously, two are locks with Iowa State and Alabama. Florida and Oklahoma State are on the on the bubble. And you could argue Oregon, if they get healthy and they get hot, they could sneak out of the bubble. Those are five good wins. So maybe this team is just not built to beat non-conference teams. I mean, that could be a good thing, could be a bad thing. I mean, in the tournament, you're going to play mostly non-conference teams. There's an off chance they'll match up with a Big East foe, but maybe that's the case. Maybe it's not. It's just something I notice, something I think about. Well, in my opinion, the Big East has the toughest road games on all of college basketball, and that's really shown so far. I mean, other than our – uh, the meltdown at XL. All of our losses have been at home. And I mean, after we lost that game to Seton Hall, I'm not sure if you guys watch it, but I watched Xavier lose to DePaul in Chicago at the Winchester Arena down there on the uh, campus of DePaul. So really anything can happen to road teams on the Big East. And I think the thing with the, the whole non-conference thing is that it was at a neutral site. You know, there's not going to be many fans for, for each side. Um, there's probably just going to be, I don't know who's hanging out in Portland, Oregon there besides Bill Walton, but there'll be, there was a decent amount of people there, you know, not really passionate fans, but I mean, every Big East road game is going to be tough. So that's, they're, it's not that they're not built for the Big East, but it's these, these road games go a little, get swept under the rug by the, uh, the college basketball community. And I think it's really starting to show, I mean, Providence got destroyed at Creighton. I mean, they made it close in the very end, but they, Creighton had them all game. Um, I mean, I don't know a bunch more off the top of my head, but these Big East road games are really tough. So that's, it's, it's really not the fact that we're not built for it. It's that these road games are just the worst thing ever. In my honest opinion, I feel like the Big East is not, you know, what it used to be. Everybody loves to talk about that physicality that it has, but the physicality doesn't matter when there's a whistle being blown every time anyone goes into the paint. And I'm not just saying that for UConn. I'm not just saying that wishing that we got more calls or saying that they got too many. It's entirely even, but it's just too much. And this is becoming a bit of an issue because I feel like anytime anyone would drive into the paint on Sonogo or Klingon, two very physical guys, you know, the whistle would be blown. They have nine combined fouls. And it's like, how are they? supposed to play this tough physical style of basketball when you're blowing a whistle on them every time. And it, and it goes both ways. It, we didn't lose because of free throws, but at the same time, it would it, it would be nice to have a more free flowing game of basketball so that momentum could stay on, the team could stay on, and they don't have to worry about having to cool down and, you know, lose their momentum all within five minutes because they're calling a foul every time someone drives in on them. Yeah, I maybe just want to say one last thing here about this squad. And it's that in basketball, good good basketball comes in stretches and bad basketball comes in stretches. We had a stretch of some really good basketball. And it's like in football, if you play a bad game, you play one game a week and you have the entire week to watch film, entire week to practice. Basketball, you're playing multiple games a week and it's really hard to get yourself out of a slump, you know, during one game. It's going to take a couple games. So I think the future of this team is bright and – I'm sure things will get better. I'm just, I'm pretty sure of it. All right. Cause we know that their ceiling isn't as high as we thought maybe, but their floor isn't this bad. It's not, they're a very talented team and they proved that at the beginning of the season and things are just going tough right now. They're getting dealt some tough cards and they're going to make a comeback. And I'm just putting that out there right now. One of you guys mentioned that in this Seton Hall game, there was no Dan Hurley and his right-hand man, Kamani Young. They were both out with COVID concerns. They didn't make the trip to Jersey. So Luke Murray and Tom Moore, I believe Murray was the handling the offense and more the defense, but Murray was the one standing the whole game. They really were a duo. I'm not saying that's the reason they lost, but when you don't have your main guy and his right-hand man like Kamani, it's really tough to win a game on the road. And another interesting fact I just remembered from that broadcast, Shaheen Holloway and Dan Hurley, Played both played at Seton Hall. It was the first time, would have been the first time, that two coaches that went it to the same Big East school coached against each other. So that's just a cool fact I noticed. And I'll talk a little bit about the game as a whole here, then we'll move on. Really, not too much to talk about. Uh, UConn was led in scoring by Adama Sonogo, 
also Jordan Hawkins in double figures and Tristan Newton. Uh, let's see. Seton Hall, they just dominated, it felt like, in the second half. I mean, every other play we were getting dunked on, not just, like, scored on, dunked on. Like, there were three or four posters by them, and at the end, they just out. They were more physical. Casey Nadefo got the foot back. And I just want to hear your guys' opinion on this. In the last play, Donovan Klingon was on the bench, for, and Sonogo was in the game. Would you have done it differently? I mean, Klingon, obviously, he's taller. Maybe he could get some boards, maybe alter that putback from Nadefo. I just want to know your guys' thoughts there. Would you have done that differently? Out there. I mean, if we still had him, I would have put Javante Brown Ferguson out there. I mean, we have to have the tallest guy out there in that situation because you knew exactly what they were going to do. Everybody watching that, everybody in the stadium knew exactly what they were going to do. So you have to have the seven-footer out there to challenge him at the rim. But do I think the refs would have called a foul if Kling was out there? Yes, I do, because that is how the Big East refs have gone this season. Um, but, I mean, you you have to take that chance of putting Klingon out there. I mean, it's just what you have to do in that situation. The biggest guy's got to be on the floor for that last play. Yeah, and for Seton Hall here quickly, a guy that all UConn fans, they don't want to hear his name. He's had a couple of monster games, Kadari Richmond, the Syracuse transfer. He popped off last year in the road game against the Pirates, and this year he had 18 and 10, and that's coming from, like, the lead ball handler position. So, I mean, it's just really a tough loss to swallow as a whole. I mean, like Matt mentioned, leading for over 39 minutes in this one and ended up losing. It's just really tough. I mean, they'll bounce back. They have a, I don't want to say favorable schedule coming up with Butler and then you get Xavier at home who they'll still be likely a top 15 team, maybe even higher, even though they lost to DePaul. And then after that, you have DePaul on the road, which clearly isn't a give me. You just saw Xavier lose and uh, Georgetown on the road, which they're Georgetown. If we lose to Georgetown, I think we'll hit the panic button officially there, but they have a sort of favorable schedule these next four five games i'm curious to see if they can bounce back i think they will yeah according to uh dave borges seton hall had the lead for eight seconds in that game and they won um but you know that's just how some games go and if you're on uconn twitter this is the last thing i'm going to say if you're on uconn twitter like i am you see a lot of overreactions, and that is exactly what I saw. But this one in particular stuck out to me. So shout out to uh, Dan Lazinx, if you're watching this, for this uh, overreaction. But he said, am I worried that Stefan Castle asked for his release and doesn't come to UConn next season? Yeah, I'm starting to worry. And a little while after he posted that, Stefan's mom, decided to uh, reply to it and said, we have to be together winning and losing. We're in a rough patch, but I feel that we would be better this season. Your point guard is ready to show up and suit up for this Husky squad. And I'm ready to sit in the parent section and meet all of you so that we can prepare for our next banner. You know, that really struck out to me because are people going to worry about that if we keep losing like that? Yes, but clearly, I mean, his own mom said he's ready to suit up. And that just stuck out to me because he's a top 15. I think he's exactly 15 in the, uh, I think it was the rivals.com rankings that came out today for the 2023 class. So that, that's just really like, that really gets me hyped up for next year. Cause I think that, I think that kid's going to be great for us, but yeah, that's just how we're going to end. This is just keep supporting the squad. You have no reason not to, I mean, think about where we were five, six, seven years ago and think about where we are now. And that's just all I have to say about that. Keep supporting this squad. Yeah, that's a great way to really close out the talk about the Seton Hall game. And I'll kind of piggyback what you said about Castle into this next little quick segment here about recruiting. Tahad Pettiford, I'm hoping I'm saying his first name right. He, We are in his top seven, and he, he will be announcing February 1st where he's going, the top seven, UCLA, Auburn, Kansas, Kentucky, us, Seton Hall, and Ole Miss. And now he was at the Creighton game when we won, and he was also at the game against Seton Hall. And I'm not sure if this is true. I saw it on Twitter. I'm not sure if it's confirmed. He was sitting behind the UConn bench. So that's interesting to see. So he would definitely be a big pickup. He's a top 25 point guard. I'm, I'm not sure if he's a five-star or four-star. He's on the on the brink. He'll probably be like a castle where he's a fast riser up into the top 10. But He'd definitely be a huge pickup, especially if a guy like Castle is a one and done. We'll have another void at that point guard position. So seeing him not only at our game against Creighton, but 
on the road against Seton Hall, assuming he was there for the Huskies. Obviously, he's also there for the Pirates, but that could be big for us. Yeah, you know, our recruiting situation is pretty good. I mean, obviously, we had Kayvon Mulready already commit to the Friars, you know. You know, good for him. You know, he's he's going where he wants, obviously. He had three Big East teams in his top four, the uh, the non being Maryland. And besides us, he had Marquette in there. So, you know, good for him, obviously. But, you know, you also got to think about the team right now and what these kids are realizing. Like, I think that Castle is getting ready to really help this team out more than he imagined, uh, which is good because he's clearly a very talented player. But, yeah, I did a little research this morning on Tahad and he is technically the 20th ranked player in the 2024 class and is listed as a four star, but uh, Castle was also listed as a four star. And I think he became one um, in the summer. I want to say he became a four star, but a five star, excuse me, but yeah, he's technically listed on the rivals.com website as a four star, but like Joe Tipton for Tipton edits keeps like saying that he's a five star, but I think he's someone that can really help us out because he's an explosive guard. But another name to watch out for is Boogie Fland, who is the ninth ranked player in the country. And if we get him and Tahad Pettiford to suit up with guys like Castle, Solo Ball, Jalen Stewart, uh, Jaden Ross, Singare, I mean, this team is going to be dangerous and full of young talent in the next two years. But, I mean, what my sources are saying is that it's it's a pretty good chance that UConn lands this kid because all these teams that, like, he puts in his top seven, like, I don't even know if he's visited Ole Miss or Seton Hall. Technically, well, he probably visited if he's at the uh, the game the other day. But, you know, this – this recruiting thing's a whole roller coaster. And I think if we don't get those guys, we will get somebody in the top 20 because we are a top 20 program. So, but watch out for Tahad Pettiford and Boogie Fland in the next couple of months. I've been uh, growing a little skeptical on recruits and recruiting because nowadays I feel like you can earn a five star, you know, doing cool dunks. And it's honestly just not the same as it was. I feel like they rank these players a lot differently now than they did 10, 15 years ago. But I mean, one thing we can't forget is, you know, what we have right now. We got a few guys right now who are looking very good for the future. We have the Fab Five coming in next year, plus Caravan, plus Klingon. And then we got to see what happens, you know, with the other guys, Andre Jackson's of the world, the Adamus and Nogos. Are they going to leave next year? Are they going to stay next year? We're not sure. But, you know, next year, year after, you're looking at a pretty good squad with the depth that, you know, you're, you're building. I feel like a lot of Hurley's, you know, motive – for his recruiting is to build nice depth because over his first few years on the team, he had very deep benches, which, you know, underperformed a little bit. I remember, you know, we had Josh Carlton, Brendan Adams, and those guys were supposed to be like bigger pieces. And I remember Brendan Adams had a bit of a slow season and Josh Carlton didn't get the production that I thought he would. He left for Houston, you know, ended up doing a little better over there, but, you know, we have to see how Hurley, will progress these players because I feel like that's the most a part of it, most important part of it. And we, um, you know, we've had a difficult time, you know, obviously we had book night come in and he was a superstar for us and he left after two years, but what about the Jalen Gaffney's of the world? You know, I know he got injured, but a cook, a cook, he was on a path to stardom and he, you know, now he's gone. And I'm, I'm just very curious as to how these guys will progress when they come in, you know, given our history. One thing is over the last couple of years, Dan Hurley has really developed um, a couple more pro players than we had in the years before then. So I think the recruits are starting to see this. Um, I think we're going to produce a couple more this year. Um, I think Jordan Hawkins could definitely go this year to the draft. Adamas Nogo could end up on an NBA roster. Andre Jackson could even, depending on how he finishes off the year. So what he needs to keep doing is producing pro players developing guys and then guys are going to want to come yeah, and producing pro players it's not just the recruits coming in you see a guy like Tyrese Martin who played two years at URI transferred over here and after two years at UConn was drafted to the NBA I'm not too familiar with his game at Rhode Island but I doubt he was an NBA prospect at the time so that shows even got transfers like I mean obviously our transfers they're a little different story this year but even it could be appealing to other guys that could come over like, Hey, you come over here. There's a chance we could make you a pro by the time you leave. That's just really appealing. And also, like I mentioned, 
all the top young talent. You also could they're, they're hit and miss. I mean, we mentioned Book Knight and Hawkins, but in that Book Knight class, there was Gaffney, like you mentioned, he hasn't been great. And in that Hawkins class, there was Rasul Diggins, who's all coming off the bench at UMass. So it's really you got to hit the jackpot. I mean, we have a couple of times. I feel like we'll have multiple multiple jackpots in this incoming 2023 class, but I feel like there will also be a couple of the, I don't want to call it the Diggins. He's not a bad player, but he didn't really pan out like we expected him to. And I think we'll shift gears here. We mentioned Tahad Pettiford. He was at the Creighton game. I highly doubt he had to pay for a ticket, but if you guys want to go to a game, you will have to pay. But if you use SeatGeek and use code HBTH at checkout, you can save $20. I have the Butler game here. It's It'll be tomorrow by the time you guys see this. Tickets are a little low compared to other other UConn games. Obviously, the team is struggling Sunday. It's football Sunday. But, I mean, tickets, let's see, they're starting around $60. You can get that for 40 if you use code HBTH to check out on your first order at SeatGeek. I mean, the guys need your support at the last home game versus Seton, not Seton Hall, uh, St. John's. There were some fans booing the team. I mean, I know you guys listening, you would never do that. We need you in attendance for the Butler game. So, so you don't boo the team. and. I guess go Huskies and we'll move on to the Butler game. We'll do a quick little preview here. This is UConn's first rematch of the season. We play, haven't played all our opponents yet in the big East, but this is the first time we're playing a team for the second time. And in that first matchup out in Indianapolis, UConn, there was a close one, but they pulled away in the end behind Adama Snogo's dominance inside and Butler. They, they're an okay team. They're a bottom half, definitely in the Big East, but they're nothing to look over, obviously, with a team like us that's struggling. And let's see, do you guys have any players to watch for UConn for Sunday's game? Yeah, I have a player to watch, and you actually just said it, but it's Adamas and Nogo. And last time we played them, it was earlier this year, and he had 27 and 14, I'm pretty sure. And I think if you – I, I can't do the numbers on this. I personally don't have the capabilities for this. But if you look at games where Sonogo had over 20 points and over 10 rebounds, we had to have won a lot of them. That has to be the formula for us winning a lot of games. And Butler's a perfect team to do it against. It's a team that he knows he can play very well against. And he hasn't been, um, I'll say, cooking very well lately. He hasn't been playing great lately. And I think this is a great game for him to pick it up against a weaker team. For my player to watch, I'm going to go with a good friend of the podcast, Alex Caravan. Uh, he's strung together a few good games recently and a lot more physical. He's been a lot more physical in the paint, getting on the O-boards, getting on the uh, defensive boards. You know, I've really liked what I've seen. I feel like a team like Butler uh, will forget about him a little bit. I feel like they're going to be focused on Suppy Sonogo, who just ran all over them last time, stopping Jackson, stopping those kinds of guys. I and mean, I feel like they might, you know, slip up on an AK a little bit. So I expect like a... Uh, 15 plus point game for him, you know, sun solid to where, you know, he won't be the reason we win, but a big factor for sure. Watch out for this entire roster. I mean, we've lost set five of our last six. These guys, they're back at home against, I'm not going to like say that Butler's bad because no team in the big East is necessarily um, like, described as just bad i mean each team has qualities but you know definitely against a weaker uh bottom tier i'll say team back at home i mean the play should be full no matter what so i mean this this is a perfect game for uconn to put up 80 something points and really get back on track here so watch out for the entire roster they're going to want to win this one they're going to want to win it bad And before I give my player, I'll do my weekly stat correction here. Sark, you said 20 and 10 for Sonogo. I just did a very quick look at his past game logs. I don't think UConn's ever lost when he's gotten 20 and 10. It's happened around like five times. You feel like it's happened more often. It's only happened five or six times. But my player to watch for this one, it's really maybe not a route you guys are expecting me to take. I'm going with Naheem Aleen. I mean, last time versus Butler out in Indy, he hit three threes, finished with nine points. And after that, he's really – his stock has fallen tremendously offensively. He hit three threes that game. He has hit two threes in seven games since. So maybe just against Butler, maybe that's his team. Maybe he'll go off again. Not not saying nine points is going off, but for what he's done this season, I'd say that's a solid effort. I think 
uh, I'll just say Naheem Ali is my player to watch. And also uh, maybe another side player to watch, Samson Johnson. He was – I'm pretty sure I saw he was dressed against the Pirates. He did not check into the game. But he was in shorts there. Maybe maybe, maybe it's because Hurley wasn't the coach. We'll go with that. And he didn't want to, Luke Murray to throw Samson into a spot that he wasn't comfortable in. Maybe we'll see some Samson. Hopefully it's a win and a win to the point where we can see some Samson action maybe late in the second half. I think it would be good for him, good for the team. But, yeah, we miss his presence inside a lot, especially in a game. Obviously, he was active, I believe, for the Seton Hall game. But say that goes to overtime, so no go fouled out, Klingon had four. What are you going to do? Do you go to Sampson there? Do you go to Richie Springs? Do you just go small ball? I mean, good to have that option at the end of the bench. Big stretch of the games for the rest of the season. I mean, we really need Sampson to – be able to defend guys like people. I mean, people we've already played, like Eric Dixon, who Sonogo kind of struggled with in the Villanova game, and then Joel Soriano, who Sonogo also struggled with a little bit, but not quite as bad. But a guy like Samson could really come in and change the pace of the game, get Sonogo off that guy and guarding somebody different. I mean, there's plenty of bigs in college basketball. Fremantle uh, is another one, but, you know, Samson's going to be an important part of this team as soon as he's able to come back. But keyword, ready, when he's ready to come back. Because the last thing we need to do is do what the uh, the UConn women's team is doing to AZ FUD right now. Uh, if you don't watch that team, she hurt her knee, uh, was out a while, came back for the first game and hurt it, I think, like in the first half of coming back after missing like seven or eight games. Now she's out for the foreseeable future. So that's exactly what we don't need to do here with Samson. Um, and it's weird that he was out for so long with an injury that, I mean, we all watched that game. Connor, you were there. He didn't like go down with anything. Right. So it's just weird that, that he's been out for so long with a, an injury like that, but you know, we don't, we don't need to rush him back. You know, we definitely, we want him back, but as soon as he's ready, Yeah, obviously we had we've had our success without him. Not saying if we bring him back, we'll struggle. We're struggling now without him, so there's no clear answer to that conundrum. But he definitely major piece to this team. Obviously, he's a starter coming into the season, so I hope he comes back. Hopefully, I see we see some time from him in the Butler game. But if not, just we just want to be healthy. That's the main thing. And I think that'll just about do it here for episode twenty. Kind of a shorter episode compared to some of our previous lost rants. We'll call them. But I mean, the team—they're in a funk. Uh, we're all—we're all very confident here. How about the Huskies? They'll get out of it. They're—they're going to finish strong. Obviously, the tough road games are out of the way. I'd say Seton Hall is in the top half of the Big East for road games that are challenging, even though it's kind of a local rival. But yeah, Butler game coming up. Then you got X at home, like I mentioned. That's big, big couple of games to really boost the team morale. And yeah, thanks for watching, and stay tuned for future episodes.